You waste time on the things that are important to you. What you don't like is to have your time wasted. So to literally sit in an airport and do nothing, that is insane to us because we're so curious and we're such lifelong learners. So heaven forbid I'm going to be anywhere and not be able to learn something. It's the Inspiration Place podcast with artist Miriam Shulman. Welcome to the Inspiration Place podcast, an art world inside a podcast for artists by an artist, where each week we go behind the scenes to uncover the perspiration and inspiration behind the art. And now, your host, Miriam Shulman. Hey there, this is Miriam Shulman, your curator of inspiration. Welcome to the Inspiration Place. You're tuned in to episode number 302, and I am thrilled to bring on one of my really good friends and share an incredible conversation with you. I'll be sharing some of my most embarrassing ADHD moments, some of them recent, because as someone who struggles with ADHD my whole life, I do have poor impulse control. Now, this showed up in high school, which I called the M&M debacle, and it still plagues me years later because when I'm really tired, my resistance is down. So I have even worse impulse control. And so that story I'm referring to now as Cream Gate. Don't worry, you will learn both of these stories in today's podcast. You're going to hear myself and my guests be open about our struggles But I want you to know from the very start that I also recognize that this quote unquote poor impulse control can be a great strength because even though it means sometimes I make purchases or eating decisions that I later regret, I also recognize that my impulse inhibition allows me to take bigger risks, risks in my art and risks in my business and risks in life. And so that also sets me up for great success. My guests and I will discuss the importance of knowing yourself, understanding your mind, and the steps you can take to thrive in your personal and professional life. So whether you're looking to deepen your understanding of yourself or seeking ways to unleash your full potential, you're in the right place. Our guest is a thought leader in the ADHD community. And she's turned her journey of discovery into a mission to empower others. After her son was diagnosed with ADHD, she dove headfirst into understanding the condition, only to realize that she too shared this neurodivergence. But instead of accepting limitations, she fired the naysayers and embarked on a quest to flip the script on ADHD. She has an background in law, and she's used to using her analytical skills to dissect and disseminate the true strengths that lie within a diagnosis, proving that it's not a deficit, but a different way of thinking. She's the author of the groundbreaking award-winning book, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, that throws the conventional narrative on its head, celebrating the too muchness of women who've been misunderstood for so long. And if that's not enough, she hosts a podcast that's been a rallying cry for smart, driven women everywhere, offering a space to discover their brilliance within their bustling minds. Welcome back to the Inspiration Place, Tracy Atsuka. Hey, Tracy, welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. We haven't chatted in a while. Poor Tracy. I just like she she jumped on Zoom and I was like, no, 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 we're not chit chatting pre mic. I was gonna. Well, I won't. I won't say what I was gonna ask you. You can ask me, and I can delete it. Should I stop recording? I was asking you because I know we had to reschedule, and then was I supposed to prepare for this, or was this? No, you wrote a book. That's your preparation. Okay. Okay. Oh my gosh. A sudden, you know that ADHD thing. It's like crap. Was I supposed to repair something further? No, no, no. At you this just, point, hopefully, you just have I know to it. Show up with your lipstick on. That's it. Oh, it's like okay, yeah, okay. No. Well, you look fabulous. So do you? I love your your shelf. Your whole shelf game is very nice with all the books well, back there. 
I just had a live television interview. And the funniest thing was that literally one minute before we're airing, the producer comes, you know, into the Zoom because it wasn't live. It was, you know, it was on Zoom and it was live, but it wasn't in studio. And she tells me, oh, my publisher, my producer has a real problem with ass. We're not allowed to say it. And anything that you've got behind you, you need to remove if it says ass. And I'm like, I can't redo this in a minute. So I thought, okay, I'll just, I got creative and I had a bunch of big post-it notes, not the small ones. And I just cut a little thing out and I slapped it on the book and they were okay with that. But oh, Lordy. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, well. I know. You can say, you can say ass on this podcast. Oh, Oh, good. Well, you know what? I've never done this before. I didn't know what a problem it would be. It's come up a bunch of times. So if anybody is thinking about writing a book, you want the asterisks in whatever the word is. And if we were to reprint this, I would absolutely. You know what? That was your publisher's job to think of that. You think? I yeah. think. You know, it, so it's so crazy. So for, for the listeners, I don't know if I've complained about this on the podcast before, but writing a book is kind of like doing a group project in college where you feel like you're doing all the work. And you're like, wait, what? why am I doing this? <laughs> like, why aren't they doing their share? Why am I doing that? Well, and what was so hard for me, and I don't know if you can relate to this. I think you can, because if it weren't for you, this book would not be done. That's so, so kind, Miriam but that's and I, not necessarily true. Well, This book was going to happen, but thank you. You were the only person that I knew that worked with that specific publisher. Granted, not we had different acquiring editors, yeah. but that specific publisher. And so because you were a year ahead of me, I kind of went through what you went through, right? That's and right. then I was able to apply it to what I was going through. But the hardest part for me was I am not used to people telling me what to do. And finally, I was in a situation, it did remind me of back in college or back when, you know, in corporate America, where I had to just kind of suck it up because what I figured is they know so much more than I do about what they do. Mm. And they just needed to get the book out of me. But it was really hard because, again, I couldn't go on and just do what I wanted to do. You know, a lot of times I would be thinking about, oh, well, this was like months after, you know, the book came out. And I'd be thinking, well, what ha- months after the book just came out months after we went through our first edits? Yeah, I would think, oh, well, what about that story? What happened to that story? And it was gone. It was just cut. So you don't really know what's taken out. And certainly for my brain, I'm big picture. I forget things until I actually remember them. And then it was like, well, why would you take that story out? That was the best story. But, you know, short of going through and making sure that it really was, it was taken out. I'm, yeah, it was it's, taken it's out. It's okay. It's it's in your podcast or it will be in yeah. your podcast or, you, yeah, God forbid you write another book. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> that's the thing is they know, like they kept telling me things like, Tracy, people are not going to like you if you say this. Like, I, I was oh, that not happened to, to me. Say- that happened yeah. to me. There was there was some things that I had to take out. And I was like, really? They're like, yep. yeah. Yeah. Yep. Take any, that out. Any signs of any kind of wealth. Yes, like- that's, that's what it was. And I had this whole Rolex thing in there because there was a great Dan Kennedy antidote about how you don't buy a Rolex watch for $49.50. And you probably wouldn't buy one for $400 either. So it's easier to sell a Rolex for four thousand, five thousand, or even six thousand than it is to sell it for less because it's a really good lesson for artists. Now I still tell that story when I do webinars, but they would not let me put it in there because they said they don't they don't want me to be perceived as the type of person who buys Rolexes. I was like, but I don't buy Rolexes. They said, doesn't matter, just don't talk about it. I was like, okay. Well, and that's a huge thing, right, among investment bankers. I mean, it's all about the watches. And so I was never into it, but like it's a male thing. Like for men, it's like it's like their purses. Exactly. Because it's like the way they flash their wealth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Like and Rolex is actually the cheaper brand. It's like was that Philip Patek watch that's like, yeah, you need a quote. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I don't know anything about watches. I'm anyway, like, I want to talk about your book because there's so many things to talk about. Oh, gosh. Some and, and, you're gonna exp- and now I don't remember what these things were. Good, because heaven knows if I remember what I wrote two years ago, right? Okay. Does that happen to you? Yeah. That's why I listen to my own podcast, because I never remember what it was I talked about. And like people will say to me, oh, that thing you talked about. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> Can I learn from myself? That's right. Well, that's why we do them. <laughs> we, we teach what we need to hear. Yeah. Okay. So. The three things I wrote down here was number one, cream gate. What? I do know what that is. No, you won't know what it is because this is my personal story related oh. to something you talked about. I just don't remember okay. what it was that you talked about. Okay. The second thing is um, selling M&Ms. All right. I, okay. will, I, I don't know what you're talking you. about either. But I will that's prompt your... you. Don't worry. It's okay. my job. And the third thing I wrote down was packing 10 books in my suitcase for a 10 day trip. Do you want to start with that one? Cause that's the easiest. Yeah. And that's what I do all the time. And then I, <laughs> I open one, maybe. It's like I pack the workout outfits that I never wear. And I, that I know are my, like my fantasy workout outfits that I always pack. Like, because. Yeah. Cause reason, you're going to work out every single I'm morning. Out, right. But why did I pack 10 books? On my last trip, which was like a 10 day trip. I don't know. Like yours was the only one I actually read, but like, okay. I know because you're a time optimist, right? (laughs) So we have often, not all of us, but most of us have no sense of time. We don't see or feel time. We don't even get that it's passing. And so we always think that we can do so much more than we can actually do. Now, the hack for that is. And I know you're not going to like it because I don't, but this is what I do when I'm going anywhere. I bring a Kindle. And that means I have the paperback or the hardcover. I've got the Kindle and I've got the audiobook. Mm. You knew I wasn't going to like that. How'd you know I wasn't going to like that? Okay, but for nonfiction, hear me out. The trick with the Kindle is do you use Readwise? No. It's an incredible app. And the reason I love it with the Kindle is I highlight passages that I like in the book, and then it automatically uploads to Readwise. And then once a day at three o'clock, you can set it for whatever. I get these emails that pop up with a bunch of different quotes from all kinds of books I've read through the years so that they kind of stay in my radar. But I can also at the end of the book, print out the whole page or pages of all of the quotes or things that I wanted to remember about each book. That's really smart. Do you want to hear what I do, which is so dinosaur? You highlight and write it down. I make a table of contents in the front of the book. Like I will write down this. Yours, I didn't put page numbers, but usually I do. That's smart, though. I wrote in the front of my book, things to discuss with Tracy. So as I was reading it, I would just write. And then once I had three main takeaways that I thought, okay, well, these are funny because they're stories that go along with it and they actually have lessons. Yeah. So the 10 books was definitely that whole thing. Like, and I'm guilty of this every single time. Like some, maybe it's some, maybe it's not 10 books. This was unusual. I was going to visit my son in Israel and it's 11 hour or 12 hour plane flight. But meanwhile, I'm sleeping most of the time. So I don't know why. I So I had like in my carry on a bunch of books and then in my suitcase, there were a bunch of books. And I think I thought I'd be bored while I was there, which I wasn't. Yep. Um, I did read your book because I, I thought we were going to be doing this interview as soon as we got back. And then there was another book for some somebody else's who's one of my podcasts i only read a chapter out of his book so i was like we're just going to talk about this chapter because i didn't read any of the other chapters and it was hey, at so least you read that one uh, well it was embarrassing because like i didn't prepare that well for that one and i was asking him questions that weren't his book that was like a different book that i read like, it was like could you tell the lego story he's like what lego story like oh <laughs> yeah no <laughs> like, oh i got to tell nico to take that out you know like yeah. Hey, so you may be wondering, what is Tracy's book again? 
don't worry, I've linked it up for you in the show notes, but also I've put together a book list over on Amazon. So you've got to check it out. Go to shulmanart.com forward slash book club and you'll get to see not only Tracy's book, but all the books linked up there that I talk about on the podcast. All right, my friend, now back to the show. Let me follow up, though, with what you just said. Yeah. The other thing is, too, because of our lack of sense of time, you know, we hyper focus and five hours can feel like 15 minutes. We're like, where the hell did the time go? We really struggle with wasting time. And I know that that's really you. Oh, dear. <laughs> you know, I waste a lot of time. No, you don't, actually. I do, you, actually. But you, go ahead. OK, but you but waste like, time. How did she know that? <laughs> you waste time on the things that are important to you. What you don't like is to have your time wasted. So to literally sit in an airport and do nothing, that That's... is insane to us because we're so curious and we're such lifelong learners. This is an opportunity to get all that information in. So heaven forbid I'm going to be anywhere and not be able to learn something. That's why we don't like to be early. Oh, because we cause like because we don't like to sit around and wait. No. Wasting time. Right. Our Although time. I am you early a lot of the times only because if I'm not early, I'm going to be late. Yeah. So I am doing that a lot. And that's why I pack all those books. <laughs> yeah. We, we have no problem wasting other people's time. Right. I guess we not. we do not want to waste our own time. Yeah. So in terms of time, there's one thing you talk about in your book, which actually I already do. I just didn't realize why I do it. And that is only analog clocks and watches. No digital. Because I need to see the pie. Mm -hmm. I need to see, you know, and I have clocks in every room. I don't rely on looking at my phone. I don't rely on any of that. It's like there's one in every bathroom with the hands. Only one? You know what? I probably need to get more than one because there's one in my bathroom, which I keep moving from, from the bathtub to the sink so that I can yeah. always see it. Yep. So you're yeah, right. We, I probably should get more than one. We typically need one in the shower. Because yeah. if you think about it, the shower, it's warm. It's I don't know about you, but I have so many creative ideas in the shower. But I can also spend 45 minutes in there and literally think I've been in there for five minutes. Yeah. So I was like, where'd I all that time go? There. Yeah. Yeah. It's like all I did was like loof on my leg. I don't get it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Or come up with this incredible, yeah, new idea, right? Exactly. So I thought that was awesome. And then the other thing that I love is your whole story about... Oh, I have so much time because I have to be there at six o'clock, whatever. You know, I think it was to meet your future husband for a date yeah. that wasn't going to even your fiance yet. And the problem with us is that we think in terms of when we need to be there rather than when we have to leave. Yeah. That's the problem. So like I will actually now schedule on my calendar, like not just the appointment, but travel time like this is this is when you have to leave your house you know like that's exactly if if it's some place that i have to physically be what's on my calendar is the time i need to leave the house because by the time i write that down i mean by the time the meeting comes up i don't even remember that that's what i did i right. think that's that's the time i need to be there and so i'm always going to be late right yeah so then i'm on time yeah exactly right <laughs> okay so that was uh, point number three, 10 books on a 10 day trip. Like, oh my gosh, it's it's a good thing I don't like shoes. I mean, I do like shoes, but not enough that I, it, I had books instead of a lot of shoes. I wore the same pair of shoes the entire time. Okay, number two I have down here is M&M sales. So this refers to you selling some sort of sweet treat for some sort of organization. And that's Aww. what my M&M sales were about. Like when I had to sell peanut M&Ms for drama club when I was in 10th grade and ended up gaining 10 pounds. It was like, you did the same thing. 100%. Like I just kept eating them. Yeah. I didn't eat like the whole thing, but like, you know, I was bringing them to classes and then I was opening the box because I have no impulse control. Like yeah. I didn't realize that was an ADHD thing until you wrote about it in the book. I just thought, 
I guess I like peanut M&Ms. I don't know. And then I refused to sell it after that year. I was like, no, I'm not doing it because like... I'm going to gain 10 more pounds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's our reward deficiency loop. So the ADHD brain, they think, they're not 100% sure, but they believe it's either that we don't make enough dopamine or uh, we don't process it the same way. So dopamine is the feel-good hormone. It is the motivation hormone. It is the hormone that makes you go do the things you want to do. And for the typical brain, it is what allows them to do what they don't want to do and why we struggle so much with what we do want to do. So what that also affects is this loop that I was just talking about. And what that means is that we are always looking for more dopamine. So, for example, you know, my story was that I ate 12 boxes of turtles. Each box of turtles had 12 turtles in it. Oh, my right? God. That's 144 turtles over probably about a week and a half period. And I was supposed to sell these turtles. Right. So I just thought, OK, I'm just going to break into my piggy bank for the first box. And it just kept going on like that. So what goes on in your brain, and you can do this with wine, you can do this with candy, you can do this with anything, right? Typically, it happens with food where, okay, I'm going to have, let's do wine. I'm going to have one glass of wine with dinner, and it's going to make me feel really good. So it's this, you know, reward that we think we're going to get. But because of this reward deficiency loop, we get the glass of wine, we have a few sips of it, we finish it. And we're like, I don't quite feel that satisfaction that I was expecting. So now I'm going to have another glass of wine. And it goes on and on and on like that. And that's how you can, you know, end up with issues related to addiction, too. Mm, it's like the scarcity brain is like yeah. it's disordered eating. Yeah. 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 I really love that story because I so related to it. Oh, she ate all the candy, too. <laughs> well, and so my father was a dentist. And we weren't even oh allowed to eat candy. So for Halloween, we would get all the candy and then we would bring it all to the table. There were four kids and he would pull out any candy that was because I'm a texture person. So regular chocolate, like nah, I like caramel and, you know, nuts and all of that stuff with it. Turtles. And so turtles. I love turtles. Exactly. And so turtles. He would, he would pull all the chocolate out. We were allowed to have the chocolate he would get all the rest and then he would hide it up in the attic. And so we would go up in the attic and we would just steal the candy back. But <laughs> I think that was also part of it, this you're not allowed to have it, right? Which the ADHD brain doesn't like either. And so then we'll hyper focus on that. But I ate so much candy. I stuck it under my bed, our trundle. It was bad. And we weren't supposed to have any of it. But I didn't have any cavities for some reason. I didn't either. I think it's just because I think we grew genetics. up with fluoride. Yeah. And, and good genetics. Like, I think one year my dentist tested my mouth for the acidity level or something like that. They're like, oh, lucky you. OK, cream gate. <laughs> cream gate. This happened to me when I went to Las Vegas and I needed eye makeup remover. So I went to Las Vegas for a conference and there was like a some sort of makeup cream store right next to my elevator. I says, okay, I'll get some eye makeup remover. And I went in there and they said, oh yeah, we have this. I said, is it oil free? They're like, oh no, it's really good for you. And I was like, oh, but it has mineral oil. And then meanwhile, it was like, I forget how much it was. It was either $100 or $300, whatever it was, I wasn't going to pay for it. So I said, no, I'm going, I'm going to go to the gift shop and I got my Neutrogena. Well, the next day after not sleeping all night, I had bags under my eyes. It's like, well, maybe I do need some of this cream and it's okay if I spend a hundred dollars because, you know, maybe they actually have something for the bags under my eyes. And so I was really tired. It was like five o'clock and I was very tired and they sat me down in the chair and I literally, Tracy didn't want to get out of the chair. And that was such a bad thing. It was almost like, uh, you know, you ever hear people say that they, they were shopping on Ambien or something like that. It wasn't on any kind of drug, but it was like, because I was so sleep deprived and I have poor impulse control, it was like I was psychotic. I checked out $3,000 of creeps. Wait, $3,000 of what? I know. Okay. 
okay, this is one of those moments where the editor would definitely have taken this out of our books. (laughs) So um, (laughs) just so you know, I did return all of it and got my money back when I came to my senses. But that is what I call cream gate. Was that all like, oh, cream gate because of all these different creams? Right. And well, it was, there was and... also some sort of thing that he was selling me on that you it vibrates on your face and it gives you a neck oh, yeah. lift. And I don't uh, think any of that stuff works, though. No, Do you... None of it works. None of it. I, I This is the thing. I don't. That's why, why I told the first story about how, like, I only wanted to buy the Neutrogena eye makeup remover i don't believe in that stuff not that i don't do other things like you know other expensive things okay right all right but 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 creams i don't do so but it was just because i was so tired and had such poor impulse control that it kind of it was almost like being date raped by the cream seller you know it was (laughs) like it was just it just kind of happened i was like i don't know i don't know like what happened here but yeah, I did get all my money back because like, and I do not have the creams anymore. But why did I write that down in the book? Does this remind you of anything you talked about in the book? There's got to be some, there's got to be a reason I wrote this down. <laughs> I could talk well, about I mean, story with supposedly, you. supposedly, I hate these kind of statistics, but apparently there are studies that have been done <laughs> that show that we are four times more impulsive than a boring brained human. And I think that, you know, we're all about curiosity and hope and making things better, right? It's never our mission to keep things as they are, which is why we can be so irritating to be around, because we're not happy with the status quo. It's always like, I know there's something more that can be done. We can tweak it. All I can think of, though, in that story is the only thing that works is tretinoin. What is that? The, oh, the That's cream the that actually that works. works. Yeah, but it's you know Wait, you go could to you the, spell that for us for us I ladies. Only, <laughs> I like I don't know about this. I was just about ready to say you know no, but you go to the vet for it. <laughs> you go to the doctor. The doctor prescribes it. You mean the dermatologist? We don't. You don't mean actually. But. Well, my doctor. I you know because then I don't have to pay the price of the dermatologist. Oh, okay. That's like how my daughter and I discovered that my sleeping pill was the same drug we give our cat. We go to the like Gappy Pen or something like that. It was the same exact drug. I was like, oh. Yep. No, I mean, they're very, you know, intermixed. I noticed that with when I was medication doesn't work for me. And when I was prescribed a stimulant, it made me super, super anxious. So it created anxiety. And so then, of course, they want to mask it with another drug. So then they gave me anxiety medication mm. and that made it even worse. But then when my 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 dog, my Shisu, who's really a Shih Tzu, she is so anxious and so neurotic. And so in order to get her groomed, because Shisus take a lot of effort in the grooming, we need to medicate her, which is so sad. But otherwise, she'd be all matted. And so they prescribed anxiety med for the dog, it was the same medication they had prescribed for me. Yeah. It was it was Gappy Pennon or Lexapro or you don't know. It doesn't matter. Is it Adamot? Whatever it was, Not, she got it was this. an Adderall. No. She yes. well that's that's what caused <laughs> that's the what anxiety mess. Whatever yeah. it was, she got vicious on it. Oof. Yeah. I mean like Cujo. Oof. So and apparently that's like one percent of the dog population. Of course oh. it was my dog. We found another one, but um, I was like, oh, my God, she's like scary. And this is what they gave me. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So full disclosure uh-huh. for my listeners who don't know, both of my kids have ADHD diagnosis. Both of them tried medication and it was a fail for both of them. So neither one of them are, are medicated on ADHD meds. My son he tried, what was, I think, what, Vi- Vivance? Mm-hmm. Is that one? Okay. Yeah. So what he would do is he would go in the backyard and he would play basketball until it wore off. He yeah. just could not sit and do his homework. So he would have to like use it. He was very focused on the basketball until it wore off. And then he could do his homework. Like, so, okay, well, we're not doing that drug anymore. And my daughter had the same experience you did where it would just make her anxious. So. Well, it almost sounds like with your son, so when stimulant medication really works, it's supposed to slow down the brain, right? And so it sounds like the same thing for your son. He just maybe handled it differently, where he had to go and work out to burn it all off 
So well, then he was he could focused. Sit down and focus. He was focused, but on basketball. <laughs> like this. Well, you can't hyper focus on the wrong things, I right? Mean, so then it was like, well, what's the point? Uh, you know. It's because he was really interested in basketball and he was not interested in this boring homework. It's like, what's that going to get him? I just wanted to jump in and let you know that we are hosting a live boot camp, a live boot camp in May, and you're not going to want to miss it. So even if you've done my Artpreneur Bootcamp in the past, when I do it live, it's always a different experience. First of all, my team and I are always looking to how we can make the experience better for you by adding bonus trainings. The core of it is over three days, but we're actually adding a kickoff call for you. We're also adding an artist insight call for you. So if you liked my episode a few weeks ago, where I shared Successful Artist Insight, we're going to be doing it again, and this time with different artists. So you'll get to ask those artists, hey, what made the difference for you? What was your success secret? And of course, over the course of those days, I'll be sharing with you what you need to stop focusing on because you know you're spinning your wheels and wasting a lot of time with the shotgun approach to marketing and what you should be focused on instead. You're going to leave with a very detailed roadmap of how to move your art business forward. And it just won't be the same without you. So to sign up, head on over to shulmanart.com forward slash bootcamp. All right, my friend, now let's get back to the show. So there's one part of your book that I remembered I want to discuss with you that I did not know. And that was the whole idea of, oh, and you had a name for it, like where people think everyone hates them. RSD. Uh, yeah. Rejection yeah. sensitive dysphoria. Yes. Could you explain what that is? This was fascinating to me. So they say, the medical experts, that rejection sensitive dysphoria is a symptom only of ADHD. And what it means is that you are hypersensitive to any kind of criticism and you start internalizing everything that goes on around you in a manner that it's something wrong with me. I am doing something. So, you know, I don't know, you'll be with a group of friends and you'll hear two of them talking to each other and you're, oh my gosh, she's talking about me when they are in fact not talking about you. Now, there's a heightened intuition that people with ADHD naturally have. And you can imagine if you can't 100% rely on your brain and your cognitive skills, what do you start to do? You start relying more on your intuition. So I think it's something that we develop over time. So there are instances where you are probably right and you've been, you know, right all along. But you start taking that one, two, three, four instances and then you make that the truth for everything that happens. Now, honestly, Miriam, what I think that is, is actually trauma. And I believe that if you struggled from the time you were little in school, let's say you struggled in home, at home, everything you did, you had too much, too loud, too, you know, you just, you could not get it together. And you constantly heard that from your parents. And then you go to school. Or teachers. So let's not always well, blame say, mom and dad. Okay, right. So then you go to school and you hear that from your teachers. And then you start hearing that from your friends. You're too much, you're too loud, blah, blah, blah. You can imagine that all those little cuts over time create trauma because trauma is really just you're not feeling safe. So the rejection sensitive dysphoria, I really believe, comes from the trauma of having ADHD and feeling like you're not understood especially for women who tend to internalize their symptoms, they beat themselves up. So why can't I do these things? What is wrong with me? I'm stupid. I'm broken, especially if you've done poorly in school, right? And you know you're not stupid, but because you can't learn the way they want you to learn, you're just like, I know I'm not stupid, but look at these grades I have. I must be stupid. And so then over time, you just kind of develop this learned helplessness. No matter how hard I try, I can't do it the way they do it. 
So why do I even bother? Okay, you tell me what to do. And that's kind of becomes the mission in your life, right? Is to find people that tell you what to do. And I don't know a bigger prescription for unhappiness than that, because when you are doing what everyone else tells you to do, and it's not what you really want to do, you're living their life and not your own, right? And then, of course, you're going to be miserable and unhappy. So I was telling my daughter about this part of your book uh, because she, this year, hopefully my daughter's district doesn't listen to my podcast. <laughs> the my kids here. don't either. I don't think they do. Okay. They do. I'm so sorry, my dear daughter. Okay. So she is a middle school general music teacher and general music in New York is for kids who have to take music, but they don't want to take orchestra and they don't want to do band, and they don't want to do chorus, but they have to take music. So these are the kids who don't want to do music, and they're in there. And she complains that um, they all hate her, and everyone thinks that she hates them, right? And so I told her about this book, and I says, this is why you think everyone hates you, because of this, this thing. And she says, yes, and all my kids have ADD too, and that's why they think I hate them. I was like, huh. It's a cycle. Yeah, it's a great, right? It was like interesting. But think about it. The ADHD brain is a brain of interest. When we are in our area of interest, nobody is more brilliant. When we're not, we're so miserable. So you're putting all these kids who have no interest in music. And I get how important the arts are. I totally get that. Right. But what about if you found the art that that kid was actually interested in? Right. So she it's- has like these these yeah, kids it's not her fault. Who, like, you know, the ones who have issues, they're in a place they don't want to be. No. It's and like, she stuck she's managing like a correctional them. officer in there. Oh. I think she needs a new job. She does. That's why I said I hope that it doesn't matter because she's she's not doing this job after this year. <laughs> like, yeah. As I tell you, I don't care if you work at Bloomingdale's next year. I know you're not doing this job. So just get through the year. Well, and the thing about that is. She is experiencing life every day with all this negative emotion. Yes. What do you think that does to her nervous system, right? And so if she's already ADHD and let's say prone to anxiety, because I've never met an ADHD woman who doesn't have at least some anxiety, she's just going to blow all that up instead of focusing in an area that she is personally interested in. And generates nothing but positive emotion for her. And then that becomes a cycle too, right? Because she's so good at it. Everybody's telling her how good she's at. You know, she does it. Versus this, they don't want to be there. She doesn't want to be there because they don't want to be there. And it's just this cycle of negative emotion. Right. And she's used to teaching orchestra kids. Yeah. Who chose to be an orchestra because... If they didn't want to do work, I'm sure they can do band, chorus, or general. Like, you know, they could do something yeah. else. So that's who she's used to teaching kids who really want to learn. I mean, yes, there's some people whose parents make them do orchestra. Yes. But the vast majority in there are there because they want to. So, yeah. Why would you ever? I mean, if you just think about the school system, the stupidity of trying to teach kids things they have no interest in learning. Yeah. I just don't get it. I mean, granted, we should all know about civics because look at our country right now. I mean, those are things that I get it. Those are basics. But something like music, which is supposed to be an elective, right? It's supposed to be something we choose. Right. I don't get it. Yeah, they could do theater. They could do art. They could do dance. They could do something else. Yeah, writing, anything that is their creative. I don't know. I mean... I don't want to turn this into a, like what's wrong with the district ties in, but they also have her like in a room in the library where she's not allowed to make a lot of noise. And if she wants to do instruments, she has to take them to the auditorium. But she only has seven xylophones for 20 kids. I was like, OK, she needs to get the hell out of there. I know she's she needs to get out of there. All right, Tracy. So what do you most want to say to the artists who are listening, which, by the way, like 99 percent of them have some sort of newer spicy thing? Yeah. First of all, ADHD has absolutely nothing to do with intelligence. And I think when I discovered, in fact, most people with ADHD are at a minimum average intelligence, but most of them are much higher than average. 
When I discovered that drivenness was a form of hyperactivity, that is when everything made sense to me because I would have never thought that I had ADHD. I was like, you can't be, you know, I had been a lawyer. I had run a bunch of different companies. I, you know, have been married 30 plus years. Everything by and large seemed successful in my life and everything was going really great until I hit perimenopause um, that period of time. And so what we know that they did not know, because, of course, they did no studies on women or girls when it comes to ADHD. They were all on prepubescent boys. But what we now know is that estrogen modulates dopamine. And dopamine is the neurotransmitter hormone that our brains don't make enough of. So you can imagine dopamine is already reduced 10 percent every single decade for everyone. So the dopamine's already going down. Then you get into perimenopause, and we know that estrogen goes down in perimenopause. You stack the third layer on that, which is ADHD, and what you end up with is something that I call maturity onset ADHD, where you don't even recognize yourself. You cannot remember anything. And the confidence, just natural confidence that I had always had, I just started to question everything. So. I want women to know that 75% of women with ADHD have not been diagnosed. They don't even know they have ADHD. And typically, it's when their kid gets diagnosed that then suddenly they realize that, oh, this is about as genetic as height, and they must have gotten it from someone. Now I understand, you know, they got it from me. The other thing I want them to know is that 43% of all people with ADHD are in excellent mental health. I didn't say okay mental health. I didn't say good mental health. I said excellent mental health. So what we really need to focus on is what are those 43% doing to be in such great mental health? And a lot of that is being in an area of interest, really focusing on the positive emotion and what it is that you do well, right? What are your strengths? Screw the weaknesses. If you can hire those weaknesses out as soon as possible, you will be surprised at how much of a jump you will make in the things that you really want to get done, but you're not getting done because you're so caught up in the day-to-day of it. As far as making money goes, oh my gosh, my business did not take off until I started hiring the people to support me in the things that I know, I know how to do them. I can do them, but I don't do them because I have no interest in it, in it and I don't want to do it. Yeah, it's also what I tell people, Tracy, it's also there's so many things that we just shouldn't be doing. Like even if you can do it and even if you want to do it, that's not where your genius needs to go. And we have yeah. only a limited amount of genius time in the day, just period. It's such a lie when we say to ourselves, oh, I could get more done if I had more hours in the day. No, you couldn't because you only have a limited amount of energy. And that is not because you are ADHD. That is all humans, period. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and if we're hyperactive, you know, we have so much energy. The problem is we can't get into the damn bed because we just want to do everything like all at the same time. So it really is about simplifying. Yeah. And figuring out what is it that you really want to do and what do you do that you just feel so good when you do it and after you do it, you're proud of yourself for, you know, accomplishing it. And that's what you should be focusing on. Not all the administrative, you know, stuff that, yeah, I don't care if you're good at it. You're right. You no, shouldn't right. be doing You it. shouldn't be your own assistant. If like you're not making the kind of money you want to make and I don't care if you're an artist or something else. It's because you are acting as your own assistant. Yeah. Yeah. And the minute you hire someone to do that, what ends up happening is you feel beholden to them. So you're doing the work product that you need to get done to give them what they need. 100%. And it's not just us. Like I have so many clients who just hire like even two hours a week where suddenly they're so much more organized because they have to get everything organized to hand it off to their assistant. And then when the assistant is like at their computer, they can't be on the computer. So therefore they're painting or they're doing whatever it is they need to do. Right. It's almost like they propel you forward, you know, to do what it is that you really need to be doing. 
And I even find like I get excited during my team meetings for the whole business, just by like, hey, you're going to do this and you're going to do this. And it's like, I'm just conducting now. I'm not playing all the instruments. And isn't the best thing when you look at your schedule or your to-do list and you realize, oh my gosh, I got all these things done. And all I did was that one thing. All I did was tell other people what to do. Everybody else was doing That's awesome. Absolutely. So ADHD for Smart Ass Women by Tracy Atsuka. Highly, highly recommend. I have added it to my book club, shulmanart.com forward slash book club. You will find it though in every Barnes and Noble. Like I went on the Upper West Side. I was so proud, Tracy. It was prominently displayed. For those of you who are listening, it's hot pink. It is such a pretty cover. And it reads really well. Like I read the entire thing. It's like, oh, this is so funny. All these funny, embarrassing stories that you told. I loved it. Yeah. Like when I almost got my car repossessed. I can't believe I told that story. I cannot believe I told that story. I'm still mortified. Oh, my God. It's true. You know, I was in law school. Thank God for my parents. I'm sure Miriam would have never done that, the money manager, right? Or the oh, God, investment no. banker. No, no, no. It was like the gym payments that I signed up for my, you know, going into collections. Like, you know. Oh, my God. And you're like, I am a really bright woman. How does this happen? You, you know? know? You know, I just told you, cream gate. <laughs> like, I, di- I did return it. I do not have any of them. Okay. So, dear editor who thinks it's about to get canceled, Jen Lehner was on. Instagram. And I don't know, her skin looked great. I said, oh, your skin looks so good. And so she was making fun of me because she knows all about this story. She goes, I bought a expensive cream in Las Vegas. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Tretinoin. There's all kinds of studies. It's the only thing that really works. And what it does is you increase your own collagen. You know, it's, it's either a red and A, right? It's, or is it something different? Is it the same thing as red and A? It's better than Retin-A. It's okay. better. That was, I think, the precursor. It's, I think it's T-R-E-T-I-N-O-I-N, yeah. I think, tretinoin. Okay. Well, I looked you, at my husband well, the last... other day. I'm like, here, you need this. Plus <laughs> the Googles. We'll find out. Or my yeah, daughter's, yeah. Uh, my, my vet, because you said you get it cheap from the vet. No, you don't get that cheap from the vet, but. Oh, Okay. It was actually out of New York. There was a service and I was paying like $130 a tube for it. But it lasts quite a while. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I could go to my doctor and I just asked them to prescribe it. And then it was a general physician type of thing. Yes. And then I think it was like 15 bucks or city MD or. (laughs) Right. Well, (laughs) I don't know about that. Isn't that the one that you just show up if you don't have insurance? Yeah. I remember the lines in New York, actually, during COVID. Oh, yeah, during COVID. I know. I know. I, re- I was scared of going to those places because I thought that's where you get COVID. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Tracy, do you have any last words for my listeners before we call this podcast complete? None other than you're brilliant. And the sooner you reduce the shame and realize that you are not disordered, you are not defective, you just have a different brain that operates using a different system, kind of like Max in a Windows-driven world, then the sky's the limit. Perfect. All right, mic drop. All right, my friends, thank you so much for joining me here today. I'll see you next Tuesday, same time, same place. Until then, stay inspired. Thank you for listening to the Inspiration Place podcast. Connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shulmanart, on Instagram at shulmanart, and of course, on shulmanart.com.